Um, I'm going to just turn this over to our panelists, but I thought one introductory remark wouldn't be out of place. It seems to me that this panel is utterly basic to the uh, whole project of this conference. And r rather than just state it, I'll simply try to illustrate it with a story. All last year in 2016, I was reading in just about every media I read um, on, the, on, on the East Coast or the West Coast and in Chicago that the United States economy was doing really great, that we had caught up with uh, where we were back in 2008, that uh, it was often added as a kind of sotto voce subtext, thanks to President Obama. Uh, and the general suggestion was that people should now be happy and like everything. Then uh, on election night, something else happened. Lots of people who evidently were not happy did not vote uh, as people expected. And I think that was when some people in the United States woke up for the first time that there's, they've been living in a bubble. Um, and if one goes around Western Europe, or, or I dare say even in Japan, um, you will find in most of the developed countries, even Germany, I dare say, um, there's a kind of bubble atmosphere at the top and in the media. And that derives from the phenomenon we're talking about. People have sort of lost track of the fact that, if you like, the gap between the median uh, and the mean, or the average in that sort of normal arithmetical sense, has grown and grown. And that large chunks of the population are not, as it were, anymore living in the same world. Now, lots of folks are discovering this in many ways. Uh, but the first person to sort of note it, to pull it out, and to start to build an economic theory is our first speaker, and that's Peter Temet. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, because this was written before the election of 2016. But, uh, it, okay. And so I want to start with the story, just like... Uh, Tom did, uh, just about two janitors, one who worked for Kodak in the 1980s with paid vacations, tuition support for colleges, and given a job, a tenure track job for academics, but a professional track job when she graduated in 1987. And Mr. Ramos works at Apple today, employed at Apple, not by Apple. Uh, is employed by a subcontractor, no vacations, no path to promotion. And what has happened in these 30 years is that finance has pressured companies to specialize on core activities so that the, uh, instead of hiring uh, janitors and other workers of that sort, they uh, have now been replaced by subcontractors, uh, independent they're employees of independent contractors. No equity consideration among varied workers. No benefits, no raises, no promotion. And that's just a story. Here are the facts of the decline of the middle class from over three-fifths to uh, uh, around two-fifths, with the upper going up, the upper, that's the upper 20%, that blue line going up, which will come again. And in order to understand the ramifications of this change, I've used this old model by W. Arthur Lewis of a dual economy. And so he had developing economies often had two sectors, capitalist and subsistence farming. Transition was to go to the city, but uh, for a higher wage, but the slums in all of the major cities show it's, it's troublesome. Capitalists, and this is important, in the Lewis model want to keep farmers' incomes low because that allows the capitalists to pay lower fees, lower surcharge on it to get their employees for that. So adapting Lewis to, uh, adap adapting Lewis to the US today gets us into what I call the finance, technology, and electronics 
FTE sector for that. That's the 20% with that uh, upward line. Uh, and uh, we'll get there. So low wage is uh, most of the rest. And the transition, instead of going to the city, it's having more or less having a college education. For the FTE policy is in keeping with the Lewis model, makes, makes policy for itself and likes to keep uh, the, uh, the uh, low wage sector in my uh, lexicon here uh, down and so on. And as you can see from the slide, the uh, wealthier, the, the higher income you have, uh, the more influence you have and the more conservative uh, that, that you are. So here are the data on the top 1%, which has been called the plutocrats, just to give you a little more detail of that. And since a rising share, as you come here, uh, gives you, uh, has to be offset by some falling share, then you can see the real wages have stalled for the time period exactly shown in the little story there. And the book goes into the fact that there's a lot of less mobility as a result of that there for it. Now, racial prejudice is very important in the American story because it's being used to sell government services, to, to sell limited government services, to keep those folks down. Uh, blacks are only one, uh, or African Americans, if you want, are only uh, about 15% uh, of the American uh, population. So if the low wage sector is 80%, you can see they're down about one fifth of the low wage sector. And so the uh, uh, onus of the uh, race on the decision making is very important. This is a long, long American practice. The slide just has the end of this. But of course, for the Europeans and further, it starts with slavery, with the uh, Civil War, Jim Crow, and then these modern uh, presidents who have encouraged this, uh, this process to go again for that. Now, mass incarceration is very important to this story. And prison inmates started to grow in the 1970s. So that now the US has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. And what that means is that one in three black males goes to prison during his lifetime. It, it's an amazing figure. Uh, if you just think about one out of three, uh, you know, in the relevant communities, which are very heavily in the influence in, in the black community, uh, everybody knows somebody in prison or is related very closely. So that this destroys black communities. Some of it is that uh, felons are deprived all of the benefits of citizenship for their, and as I say, everybody knows somebody in jail. There's the graph there. Uh, and we seem to be a little bit tailing off at the end. So we may be approaching a new equilibrium up there where this continues uh, out of sight and out of the mind of most people in the FTE sector uh, indefinitely for that. Uh, the interaction uh, it interacts very much between mass, there are many interactions between the mass incarceration and education. So if a black man goes to prison, no need to educate them. What are they going to do with it? And if boys are not educated, they go to prison. So, you know, it's a good circle. Uh, for that, it destroys uh, the chance of the kids in school because of the over-representation of blacks in prisons. The children with uh, 
uh, fathers in school, uh, uh, fathers in school, fathers in prison, uh, have many more trouble uh, in the early grades, which grows up to different educational things there. Now, where is the link between these things, the race and there? And you can see this. Uh, Nixon was mentioned earlier. And what this shows, uh, got enough time to, to read it, that the Nixon White House said, we knew it couldn't make it to be illegal against the war or black, but we could associate them, uh, the, uh, the opponents, with blacks and heroin, then criminalizing both heavily and disrupting those communities. We could arrest their leaders, et cetera, et cetera. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So shouldn't think that there's a separation uh, in these, uh, the, the race and the, uh, the thing here, uh, the political process. So we now have dysfunctional politics in the US. The rich determine public policy. They want taxes and wages low. And the ultimate aim of some of the super rich is anarchy. Stated, this not made up, that's their word used. Uh, costs are borne, of course, by the low wage sector. Blacks and Latinos are largely in the low wage sector. Latinos, blacks have been here for uh, 300 years, the Latinos for 30 years, but they're falling into the same position here. And the FTE sector uses racism, fear of immigration, and misogyny to oppress the low-wage sector. And what that means, having gone on since the time of Nixon, is that this has all been embedded into the institutions of the United States, the role of the government, so that we have, as you see the word marching up the, uh, down the slide, dual systems of government. So the dual system of justice uh, is what I've just been talking about, mass incarceration. You can get put in jail or you can be driven to suicide while waiting for things just for having a, a rear light out if you are poor and black. Whereas if your tail light is out and you're white and stable, you pay a fine and go on. So this is the kind of dual nature of all of this. Dual systems of education because the uh, 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 the FTE sector has moved out, has financed their own schools, or has uh, gone to private schools. The schools continue as they have, not perfect, but very good. And urban public education, under partially under the weight of the mass incarceration that I mentioned before, uh, has been largely abandoned. Dual support for housing and transportation so that we have airports, we have uh, interstate highways, uh, but we don't have city streets without potholes. We don't have urban transportation that is reliable. And if you read some things in the New York Times about the uh, subways in New York, they seem to be largely in, into collapse. Uh, dual treatments of debt, uh, then since children are now uh, expected to, uh, to pay for their own education, uh, uh, not the typical, the historical American pattern. Uh, this is all because of the fiscal policy, which has ignored even state universities uh, and uh, or, largely privatized state universities from lack of uh, revenue from the statements uh, that the low wage workers have had mortgages in the interim as uh, leading up to the 2008 crisis for this and educational debts are now second only to mortgage debts in the accumulation of things. And since I have a minute, I'll talk about a little bit since I've wrote the book, uh, the uh, Trump administration, referred to by Tom a little before, 
has demonstrated exactly the force of the Lewis model here because even though the book was finished before then, uh, the treatment of health care uh, uh, is just exactly what the model would predict. That, after all, is the function of having a model. And so they would deprive over 20 million people, uh, the Republicans in Congress, though it wasn't the president, it was the Republican Congress, which is why I can talk about them as the FTE sector, were happy to deprive over 20 million people of low-cost health care in order to uh, eliminate the tax on high-income people uh, to, to, uh, to finance this kind of subsidy. Uh, and so, you know, if you can see this in the, uh, if you follow American politics right at the moment, in the rapid switch from health care to the massive tax cut that they want to rush through Congress, uh, that it has taken, took only five minutes for them to make this pivot, meaning that these 20 million people were not of any concern. What was of concern was getting the tax cut for the very rich. So on that note, I will stop. Thank you very much, Peter. Our next speaker is Marcella Corsi. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thanks, Inet, to Heinet, sorry, to have invited me here today. Um, so, uh, if my presentation starts, <laughs> exactly. So here we are. So let me just draw your attention to that lady over there on the left, that young lady with. Uh, Multicolor hair is called Minerva. Actually, is Athena in Greek, in the Greek tradition, is the goddess of science. And it actually represents a think tank just born in Rome, in my university, which I have the honor to coordinate, uh, and which uh, actually aims to bring together competencies from different social sciences, not only economics, but sociology, law, and so on in order to describe and also monitor, as I will try to show you today, the development of our society in a gender perspective. So as you can see, uh, the title is very ambitious. I would like to introduce you to dualism in a gender perspective. And this is something that I'm actually doing or trying to do since 2013, uh, together with some colleagues of mine, younger than me, Carlo Di Politi and Valeria Cirillo. Uh, Carlo Di Poli is here with me today. So, uh, we are talking about the crisis once again, I know. <laughs> uh, but in a different perspective. Um, because actually, due to the crisis, the concept of social class uh, is increasingly again the scene. But very rarely in a gender perspective. So that's our challenge here today. Um, at the same time, together with this concept of class, of course, quite a lot of discussions uh, have been uh, carried out on inequality, but mostly concentrated on personal incomes. So really taking into account uh, individual incomes, top incomes, uh, poor people, and so on. You certainly understand what I have in mind. And of course, uh, very often, but this is a constraint due to the data that we have to use, uh, this analysis are carried out at household level. Mm? Uh, so what we want to do instead, actually using uh, the classical economist uh, 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 theoretical approach, is to study the functional income distribution. Obviously, we're not the only one trying to do that. I do not pretend to be <laughs> completely original in doing it. And what we do is actually talking about Europe, uh, we try to analyze the development of household incomes through time in a gender perspective using uh, UCILC uh, microdata, which is, of course, the best data set we can use at European level. <coughs> so what we mean by functional income distribution? Well, 
I said just before, uh, we are in Edinburgh. We have been introducing Adam Smith several times, but I could, of course, speak about Ricardo and Neil and so on. What they had in mind in speaking about income distribution was actually the role of each individual class in the production system. Therefore, each of the household belonging to our society does receive an income according to its role. Labor income, including wages, which is calculated in our case as the sum of the adult household members of gross employee cash or near cash income, and includes, therefore, wage, but it also includes income from self-employment. Then capital income. Uh, I want to say that this is started and we start before Mr. Piketty, so it's quite important for us to, to stress this. Actually, capital income uh, is mostly a financial capital because we are living in a different world, of course, uh, compared to the classical economist, but it also includes uh, capital in the traditional sense and the form of dividends and in the forms of profit uh, for capital investment in uh, unincorporated businesses. It doesn't include uh, savings, uh, uh, I mean, firms saving. And then state transfers, which are increasingly important in our societies, of course, especially in welfare economies like the European one or what is left of the welfare economies. And therefore, it includes quite a lot of different type of benefits that households may receive according to their situation. So family and children related allowances, uh, housing allowances, and so on. I'll let you read it uh, because otherwise uh, uh, time goes by very quickly. But I'm pretty sure you all have, you are all familiar about these concepts. So what shall we do with that? Well, we analyze nowadays in 2005, well, actually up to 2015, uh, because this is the latest uh, update of the UC data set, we analyzed 1,715,000 households in 31 European countries, which of course means the 28 EU countries plus three, the so-called EFTA countries, uh, Switzerland, Norway, and Iceland. And we do it for the period of the crisis, 2008, 2015. I warn you that for 2015, you will see it in, in the charts that I'm going to show you in a second, uh, actually Germany and Switzerland are not included in the data set, and that of course makes our analysis a bit more difficult. So let's stick, to be honest, up to 2014, uh, just to be completely consistent through time. But still, we have data for 2015, and I wanted to show you, by the way. So what shall we do? We distinguish, we, we, def we try to define the sex of the households. Mm? Men, female, and male, what do we do? We take the, into account uh, uh, the declarations, of course, uh, made by the head of the family, and we define man-headed households, uh, those in which a man declares to be the one earning uh, the highest income, basically a standard male breadwinner model. But we also consider the households women-headed, so those in which it is a woman to earn most. Of course, it's a minority, but it's increasing. I will show you in a second. Actually, you can see it from there, from the table that I is already included in my slide. From 2008 to up to 2015, you have a decrease in the percentage of men-headed households, and instead you have an increase of women-headed households. Um, why? Well, there is a story behind this. Probably you heard it already. Uh, the crisis had actually two different stages. The first one that nowadays, especially in the feminist uh, literature, is called a e session, is the first is the first part of the of the of the crisis in which mostly uh, men have been affected in terms of loss of employment and increase of unemployment because <clears throat> because the crisis has hit directly the manufacturing sector, or, or in any case, sectors where, uh, where men were mostly concentrated. Um, which meant, of course, uh, that with, with the loss of job, uh, with the loss of income, uh, the, the number, the percentage of uh, men-headed ha men households has decreased through time, and at the same time, uh, it has increased the number of women-headed households in two different forms, of course. Households in which the man has lost the job and women have been forced to enter the labor market, 
or otherwise, of course, uh, situation in which uh, the man uh, does not or didn't work at all, uh, and it, it keeps uh, of not working while the women are the, one, are the breadwinner, which is, of course, uh, uh, not relatively uh, minor in terms of, of, of the of the evidence, but still, we have both, of course. And of course, then you have the single, the single people. So what happened through time? You can see, uh, you have wages, so just one part of the labor income that I mentioned before, and capital incomes. The capital income is on the right axis, the, the wage income is on the left axis. You can see, actually, through time, wage income has been decreasing, both for women-headed and men-headed households, but more for men-headed households compared to women-headed households. As a matter of fact, the income gap between these two types of households has decreased, which appears for some, uh, actually, theorists or for some analysts, uh, quite a good thing to discuss. But actually, uh, we don't think it's a good thing to discuss because, as a matter of fact, both households have become more poor. At the same time, for capital incomes, uh, the income gap is more or less stable, uh, so uh, the crisis is affecting, uh, in terms of functional distribution, men-headed and women-headed in a different way. Let's make it uh, more clear. Uh, this is the, in the, the income gap between men-headed and, and women-headed uh, uh, households uh, by source of income. You can see the labor income gap uh, has been decreasing, as I said before, the capital income, the capital income uh, gap uh, has more or less remained stable. What has really increased a lot is the trade transfer. Uh, state transfer income gap has been increasing for the reason that I told you before, because more and more men-headed households had to rely on state transfers because of the impact of the crisis. The first one, the E-session, Another impact might arrive quite soon, or maybe still, I mean, it's going on right now, but we don't have the data to show you. Actually, this is a work in progress, so we, we will keep on doing it, at least for other five years, more or less. Um, because actually the crisis, the new crisis, ha it has hit uh, the service sector, where mostly women are concentrated, the public administration, because of the austerity measures. So, it's time to know uh, what's going on, but it's too early to show you with the data. And finally, uh, well, of course, there is quite a lot of econometrics in our analysis. In one slide uh, more, and I will show you where you can read more about this. Uh, and of course, if you want to write us, to contact us, we will be happy to inform you about all this. Um, but just to show you very quickly uh, two charts, and then I stop. This is the impact of the recession, uh, in taking into account uh, changes in labor incomes and changes in capital incomes, where, they, where they actually the impact of the recession is measured, uh, taking into account the cumulative GDP change uh, between 2008 and 2014. All the dots that you see, of course, are the 31 countries. Uh, and, of course, the lines uh, just describe very quickly and very roughly the relationship between the variables that we have included in our analysis. As you can see, and as you could expect, actually a growth in the GDP actually increases uh, the labor incomes, so there is a positive effect, uh, but of course, which means that if there is a decrease in GDP, labor incomes decrease. But for capital incomes, the situation are different. And there is also a minor but significant difference in, terms of, in statistical terms between women and men. And then I mentioned just before austerity. So this is the impact of fiscal consolidation. It's measured fiscal consolidation by the, per, by the, by the change, uh, the early change of the primary surplus per capita. So you find this variable on the, um, on the vertical axis, uh, on the y-axis axis, while on the right axis, again, you have the change in labor incomes and the change in capital incomes. What means all this? That fiscal consolidation bring in two surpluses, so of course moving up on the left axis, brings what? Brings to a reduction of labor incomes. So there is a negative uh, relationship. Austerity fail, 
mm, in that sense, if we want, of course, to increase the spending, uh, uh, the spending power of our families. Uh, on the opposite side, well, as you can see, fiscal consolidation is not so dangerous for capital incomes, and both for men and for women headed households, even if, once again, there is a significant difference from a statistical point of view between these two type of households, and as a matter of fact, that this is something that we will explore also in future, uh, in future works, men headed households seem to be hit much more than women headed households. Don't ask me why now, I will let you know in few, in few years time. And uh, to know more, four publications already are available, and you're welcome for any comments and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and our next speaker is Guy Standing. Thank you very much. I worked for the International Labour Organization for many years, and I was director of labour market research. And after I left, I wanted to put all my 30 years of work together, and I decided to write a book that was called The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class. It was published in 2011, and on page one of that book, I said, unless the insecurities and aspirations of the emerging precariat are addressed as a matter of utmost urgency, we will see the emergence of a political monster. You will not be surprised that I've received numerous emails from across the world since last November saying your monster has arrived. <laughs> what I didn't anticipate when I published that book is that it would have a life of its own. It's been translated into 21 languages, sold thousands and thousands of copies, and led to me being invited to talk about it all over the world. The one place where I've not managed to get much traction is mainstream economics faculties. But I do get a lot of requests from students of economics, and have just been invited to Oxford and various other places. So I do have hope that the, the narrative is getting some traction uh, among the lower aged group of our fraternity. And now, I think the subtitle of our conference here today is actually very apt because it's uncannily close to the subtitle of a book that has been very influential in my own thinking over the years, and that is Karl Polanyi's Great Transformation. You remember the subtitle of that. And my narrative is that we're in the midst of a global transformation, the painful construction of a global market system. And we cannot sensibly understand the dynamics of what we're looking at without putting it in the global context. Just feel that that is completely inappropriate. Of course, you will all know that it began in the early 1980s with the sudden triumph of the Mont Pelerin Society. When I was a student, we regarded Hayek and his bunch as a bunch of loonies on the right but suddenly they were the orthodoxy and they took over the stables. And of course, what they pursued, as we all know, was an agenda of lib market liberalization, privatization, commodification of everything that could be commodified, and very significantly for my narrative, the systematic dismantling of all institutions and mechanisms of social solidarity that stood against the market. The institutions that actually give us the protections against the worst features of market forces. And among those, of course, are the commons. The Austrian School of Economics, which was influenced by von Mises, of course, for them, the commons has no exchange value, so it has no value, it has no price, so you can privatize it and give it away. 
And one of the untold stories of what's been happening in the last few decades, and particularly since the austerity era began, has been the plunder of the commons. And the commons are very important for providing part of the income base for the precariat I'm about to talk about. I'll leave that aside. With the liberalization, of course, there was a concerted agenda across the world for the pursuit of labor market flexibility. That was a euphemism for making labor relations more insecure and taking away certain regulatory defenses. But it's a profound mistake to think that this has been an era of labor market deregulation. Anybody who uses that term should be encouraged to take up something like sewage cleaning or gardening because they haven't been observing what has been happening. This has been a period, and I saw this in the International Labor Organization, of profound labor market re-regulation with far stronger state intervention in labor markets than at any time in history. And of course, we've seen occupational licensing taking away from self-regulating guild traditions and installing state regulation. Over a thousand occupations in the United States are today subject to occupational licensing. That's called state regulation. That's much, much more than used to be the case. And it's contributed to the occupational segmentation and stratification along the lines I'm about to describe. The other contextual point is that we've moved out of the neoliberal era into what I have characterized as rentier capitalism. Keynes famously wrote that during the 20th century we would see the euthanasia of the rentier. But since the 1980s, the opposite has happened. Systematically, with financial hegemony, the same as Polanyi would have predicted, financial hegemony led to the construction of an international architecture of institutions that have allowed rentier capitalism to flourish. The World Bank, the IMF, pursued corporate property rights to extreme, but the epitome of what has happened is that whereas the World Trade Organization was the midwife of globalization, WIPO became the midwife of rentier capitalism. When I first went to Geneva, we regarded WIPO as a joke. We thought it was a detergent company at the other side of Geneva. Today, it's the biggest bureaucracy in the UN system in Geneva. And of course, it achieved its breakthrough with the passage of TRIPS, in 1995. Just to give one stylized fact, in 1995, fewer than one million patents were registered. Last year was the first year in history where more than three million patents were registered, and the globalization of intellectual property rights is, get, is generating a vast flow of rentier income. I don't have time to go into the other aspects of rentier capitalism, but it has profoundly changed the distribution system that we're observing. Now, of course, as we all know, the functional distribution of income has become far more equal. My professor at Cambridge, one of the two, was Nicholas Caldor. There used to be a, a Caldor's law that, roughly speaking, the share of national income going to capital and the share going to labor were roughly constant. It's broken down, as we all know, since the 1980s. The functional income distribution has become far more equal, unequal, with a growing share of capital. But within that growing share of capital, a growing share has been going to the rentiers. I don't think it makes any sense to think of a dualistic economy. What we're seeing is a fragmented economy where those who are gaining incomes from rents are doing profoundly better than those who are getting income from any other source. And that leads to the emerging class structure, which I've been trying to analyze. We have a plutocracy. In Adam Smith's terms, the plutocrats are the richest men in history. And the richest man in history 
is Carlos Slim. In 2004, his annual income could have paid for the annual income of 140,000 Mexican workers, on average. In 2014, his annual income could have paid for over 2.4 million Mexican workers. The Rockefellers and the rest of them in the early Gilded Age can look with envy at his wealth. The plutocrats, of course, are corrupting capitalism, they're corrupting democracy, they're manipulating. We all know that story. Don't have time for that. Underneath the elite, underneath the plutocracy is an elite of servants, multimillionaires making vast incomes, mainly from rent. Below them is the old salariat. When I was a student of labor economics at Cambridge, we were basically told that by the end of the 20th century, everybody would be part of what I'm calling the salariat. Long-term employment security, pensions, paid holidays, paid medical leave, paid maternity leave, you name it. But that group is shrinking. That group is shrinking. Alongside it, a group of proficients, freelancers, making a lot of money, suffering from burnout, etc. And below them, the old proletariat, for which the welfare state was built, habituated to full-time stable labor and all the trappings of social democracy. They're sinking into the precariat. And the precariat, I've tried to define it, tried to measure it. We still lack adequate statistics to do so. But the precariat can be defined in three dimensions. The first dimension is that you are seeing millions of people being habituated, told to accept, a life of unstable labor. Insecure labor, that's the most obvious factor, with casualization and so on. More importantly, is they're being told, and they know this from their experience, that they have no occupational identity, no occupational narrative of development that they can take through life. And they have to do a lot of work for labor that doesn't get remunerated or recognized in our inadequate statistics, but they have to do it, and if they don't do it, they pay a heavy price. And of course, another feature is that their level of education tends to be above the level of labor they typically have. The second dimension is that they have distinctive patterns of social income. They have to rely almost entirely on money wages. Money wages that, as we know, have been stagnating or declining in real terms in most of the economies represented here for nearly 30 years. And not only declining, but increasingly volatile and increasingly uncertain. In addition, they're losing enterprise non-wage benefits. Our income statistics don't record this sort of trend, but it's hugely important for looking at inequality. They're losing rights-based state benefits, epitomized by the 1996 Welfare Act in the United States, but echoed and mirrored everywhere else that I've, I've observed. And they're on the edge of unsustainable debt. One mistake, one error, and they know they'll be homeless. Their indebtedness will crush them. Now, the last part of the definition, in my view, is the most important of all. And that is that people in the precariat know they are systematically losing the rights of citizenship, not just if they're migrants, but people inside their own societies. They're losing civil rights. They're losing social rights. They're losing political rights because they don't see a party or politicians representing the precariat, and they're losing economic rights because they cannot practice what they're qualified to practice. They are supplicants. They know that. They have to ask for favors. They have to ask for favors from employers, from lenders, from bureaucrats. And that is what makes people angry. The precariat is suffering from anomie because it cannot see 
social mobility, suffering from alienation because it cannot do what they are actually qualified to do, suffering from anxiety, chronic, and suffering from anger. And then relative deprivation is leading to politically angry reactions. And what I've tried to do and why I've predicted early last year that Trump would win and Brexit would take place is that the first part of the precariat I call the atavists. I've used that term in the books. The atavists feel they've lost what they used to have. And they're angry because they want it back. That's what the Trumps are offering. But the second group is a nostalgics. These are the migrants, the minorities, and others who feel they have a home nowhere. They don't have a present. The first group feels they've lost the past. The second group feels they don't have a present. And it's the third group in the precariat that seem to be the ones inviting me to give talks. Those are the people who were sent to university and college, and they were told if they did that, they would have a future, a career build wonderful careers. And they come out and they don't see that future. But they're angry, time is up. And this group is looking for a politics of paradise, as I described it in the books. That politics of paradise, for us economists, will mean nothing less than building a new income distribution system in which wages won't play such a fundamental part for many people but which is something like a basic income will be fundamental to that system, and which new forms of mechanisms for capturing the rents, for distributing to society, will develop. And maybe then we'll see the euthanasia of the rentier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now our first commentary is by Shannon Monat. Hi, I think I'm just going to stay sitting since I'm just a discussant, and so I'll be a little less formal. Um, thanks, Tom. And I'd like to thank INET for inviting me here and for being interested in the work I do, even though I'm not an economist. Um, I, I really appreciated re <laughs> reading these papers and uh, viewing these presentations because there's a lot of sociology built into what was written and what was said. Um, I saw leanings of Marx and conflict theory in here. Guy just talked about anime, which of course came from Durkheim, one of the fathers of sociology. So this has been really interesting for me. Uh, most of my comments are gonna be about the US because that's the context that I'm familiar with, but there is obviously a lot of overlap in things that could be applied to Europe as well. So what I'm gonna do is just briefly lay out some of the themes across these papers and then provide a couple of examples from the US that illustrate these themes. So one big theme, of course, is this idea of, of diverging economies, the rich versus everyone else. Um, it's especially prominent in Peter Timmon and Gay Standing's paper. Um, Timmons also emphasizes the disproportionate negative impact of this phenomenon on blacks uh, in particular, especially in relationship to education and mass incarceration. Marcella Corsi, lays out, of course, how dualism affects men and women differently. And so we know that race and gender are really important delineations, but I would encourage us to also not lose sight of place and space issues. Uh, the dual economy has certainly had a spatially heterogeneous effect. Over the past 30 years, nearly all of the gains in income have gone to the largest cities in the US case. Uh, primarily due to their locations uh, as hubs for things like finance and, and technology. Uh, people in small cities and metro areas in the U.S. then have seen economic prospects decline. Uh, young people have been moving to the cities for college for several decades, and they never come back. And so then what happens is that generation after generation, there's a larger concentration of the least resourced people left in these areas. So these selection effect issues really disproportionately impact the places that rely on single sectors for employment. For example, places that are farming dependent or mining dependent. 
Another theme that runs through these papers is the idea of the recession and policy responses to the recession affecting poverty and inequality. Not only were the impacts of the recession and the so-called recovery spatially variant, but state and local budget cuts hurt different places in different ways because of the vulnerability and the job opportunities in those types of places. The role of government deregulation, which I guess I should be saying re-regulation, uh, devolution, disinvestment, these are also themes throughout all of these papers. We've moved away from a core safety net system that is centralized by the federal government to one where if we can turn something into a block grant, that's what we do. And what that means due to discretion is that residents of some states and localities end up in much better situations than others. Uh, finally, these papers sometimes explicitly and also sometimes implicitly point to a lot of significant long-term implications, including disparities in education, mass incarceration, health, and of course, politics. So what I show here is economic distress measured at the county level by a group of economic variables. Um, this is the percent change in economic distress from pre-recession 2000 until right now. Uh, the darkest red are places that are still doing economically worse off than they were in 2000, and the blue are places that are doing better. We can see major spatial concentrations here, clear geographic clusterings of counties where distress has declined versus where it's increased. And it's increased in places that were once thriving economically. There were manufacturing hubs of the U.S., for instance. they are places that certainly experienced significant recession shock, but this isn't new. These dynamics have been building over at least the last three decades, and I think those themes come through really clearly in these papers. And these patterns are important because they suggest that a really large group of counties in the US are doing worse now than they were a generation before. And patterns like those really set the stage for intergenerational poverty, like we've been seeing in Appalachia, and now maybe happening in the industrial Midwest and New England. So this shows the percentage of counties that experience an increase in economic distress uh, between 2000 and the recession period, that's the orange bar. We see that the majority of counties across all levels of metropolitan status, except for rural, remote areas, the majority experience increases in economic distress from pre to recession. And the second bar shows that the overwhelming majority of counties are still worse off on four more indicators of economic distress now than they were in 2000. As Standing notes in his paper, the U.S. is now characterized by this large precariat where there's pressure to accept a life of unstable and secure labor, where not only have paychecks not increased, but you get less for your job. You're less likely to have health insurance, pension, sick leave, and that the precariat is losing all kinds of rights. Um, I should point out that none of those things are new for women or for people of color that those are things that they've been dealing with for a long time. And what's new is that all of a sudden, white males are dealing with those three issues, especially white males without a college degree. So you can see that many of the places that are worse off today than they were in 2000 are located in states that enacted austerity cuts. Austerity was one of the themes through these papers. These austerity cuts have had a differential impact on people in different places. States and localities are now increasingly at a race to the bottom. How many tax incentives and subsidies can they give to big corporations to come and relocate to their town? We see it happening right now with Amazon, where places are begging Amazon to come to their, their locality, and Amazon will get all kinds of goodies out of the deal. Um, when Walmart starts leaving towns because the towns are going so bad, then you know there's really a problem. So there are places where Walmart can't make it and dollar stores are coming in. Dollar stores are like the new big growth machine. And what's so fascinating about that is that people in these areas are now buying the very products that led to a lot of small businesses leaving these types of areas. They're cheap, they're imported, and so it's become this cycle that reinvents itself. There are also hints about the dualism of opportunity in these papers. So of course we know that the takeoff of income inequality is one of the most important things that we've seen over the past 50 years. Um, but what's really important about that divergence in income, that income inequality, is that the real teeth come from that it now costs more to buy things that used to be free. So not only are wages lower, but the working and middle classes are now doubly disadvantaged. Because it's not just that they have less money 
than they did before. It's that money matters now more for securing uh, certain opportunities, better schools, for instance, better health care. Okay, so people have to pay into living in areas that will get them the quality of education and health that they could have gotten 50 years ago uh, by not having to pay so much. So this trend really points to this commodification of everything, including, by the way, prisons. I'm going to skip this one. Okay. So the consequences. We now talk about rural areas in the US much like we talked about uh, urban inequality and urban distress in the 1980s, these structural issues that have led to declining communities, opioid and alcohol abuse, family breakdown, crime, certainly declining health. Um, and these are all really important because they have long-term implications for the sustainability and viability of these areas. This shows drug-related mortality at the county level. Again, we see really clear spatial clustering. We see both urban and rural areas with high rates of, of drug abuse. And what's clear about these is that they're tightly connected. These patterns are tightly connected to economic distress, but also family distress and declines in social interaction, social cohesion. We've seen upticks in suicide among both men and women during the recession period. For men, the upticks were between 2008 and 2010. Women had a lagged effect for about a year. So suicides are increasing with the recession. Talked about incarceration. Uh, the level of incarceration has increased astronomically, and part of that is a result of private prisons. Private prisons who have lobbyists and who give campaign contributions for, to ensure that people will continue to get locked up, more people will get locked up, and if you read that quote, the gist of it is that the Corrections Corporation of America is really happy that they've been able to fill up their prisons for, for economy of scale issues, and they're going to keep engaging in methods to make sure that they get to have more product in their prisons, commodification of, of incarceration. And then, of course, there are the political implications. This is a map that shows Trump's overperformance, how he did relative to Mitt Romney in this election. And no, how he did relative to Mitt Romney as a, as a sort of baseline. Uh, and so what you see here, again, is clear spatial clustering across the um, industrial Midwest. And of course, the, that region was the difference maker. And that region is the one that has experienced almost all of the economic decline. That's not me. But I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy to take Adam Smith's quote if we need to. Uh, the last point here with this graphic is just that it's not just economic distress that was related to Trump's overperformance, that it was all different levels of distress. Health distress, drug, alcohol, and suicide mortality, uh, family distress in both metro and non-metro areas, every distress indicator you could think of, Trump overperformed most at the highest quartile of that distress indicator. So these things are all wrapped up together. It's not just the one thing. And on that note, I will pass it to the other discussant. Thank you very, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shannon. Um, one comment, which is that on the day after the election, the private prison stocks, my memory is they doubled or so in the, in the next few days. They, mm -hmm. they shot up like rockets. Uh, I mean, that's an event analysis of, quite, of great interest. Anyway. Um, our next commentator is Sarah Storm. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, start. Uh, I, I start by saying that it is difficult to comment on the three papers because I'm basically in very fundamental agreement with what, is, what has been said. So it's like, it's not a critique uh, with which I can, can come. Uh, I only want to sort of, uh, what I will do, it's also not a very structured uh, presentation, I don't have slides, I will just sort of uh, throw in a number of items which I think, uh, questions or items which I, th which I think are important. <coughs> First of all, I have been working on uh, the dual economy or dual, uh, dualization uh, myself. Uh, in a way, it started with uh, when I started to look into the German experience after the crisis or after the, Euro the introduction of the common, common currency. 
and in a way, uh, one of the things which came out of the of, 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 of sectoral out of the data is basically yes, Germany is becoming a dual economy as well. It's like we have a very strong competitive high tech core in which workers are unionized and are protected, and then we have a growing um, non-protected services, mostly services sector, uh, low wage, mini jobs, and so on. Everybody knows the story. It's flexible, flexible work. Flexible work, I tell my students always, flexible work is a beautiful term because everybody wants to be flexible. But the question, of course, is also, is always flexible for whom? I mean, who, who is being flexible? Well, it's like we shift the burden to uh, one group and uh, it's sort of a one-sided flexibility. Anyway, nobody wants to be uh, non-flexible, but mm, there might be something to be said for more uh, rigidity. Uh, rigid, uh, rigidities. I'll come back to that point. Uh, the first uh, real point I want to make is that if it is true, and I think it is true that uh, the, the OECD countries, the rich countries, uh, are becoming more dual, like core and, and non-core, dynamic, non-dynamic, uh, non then I think this has very, very profound and not, as yet uh, little understood uh, consequences for macroeconomists. Yeah, in a way, I mean, this maybe is overstating, but in a way it means that uh, much of the macroeconomic uh, approaches uh, have to be modified or um, if they can't be modified become meaningless. Yeah, I mean, what, what does it mean when we talk about growth? If, if, the, if the growth is actually not, uh, the, there's a big difference between median, median and average. Uh, what does it mean unemployment when again there's this, it's sort of one-sided, the, the burden is shifted to, uh, so, and uh, we can talk about interest rates, inflation and so on, but the point is the whole, the, the, we basically have two economies. This is something which Arthur Lewis meant, uh, modeled or sort of formalized, it is something which, is, which has been there in development economics. And in a way, I think what we are seeing is uh, uh, maybe slightly uh, strange uh, that the, uh, earlier on the OECD countries were sort of the, uh, the, the, the ideal or the, 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 the goal to, to uh, the end goal of development would be uh, trying to become an industrialized and also organized and coordinated economy. And in a way, uh, we, what we get is we get a convergence, but the convergence is the OECD uh, economies are converging back, uh, you could say in a way, to uh, being dual with a, with a, with a, with a, with a large inform. I mean, we, we call it, in, for developing countries, we call that an informal sector. Uh, actually, this is an informal sector. So that's the first point. The point, point is that we, this is something which macroeconomists have to take up. Uh, the second point is that I think uh, there's something which uh, Peter Temin mentioned this, uh, uh, but I, I want to sort of emphasize it again. Uh, I think it is uh, very largely also uh, driven by uh, technology. That is, uh, if you look at uh, manufacturing and if you look at sort of productivity growth, continuous productivity growth happening in manufacturing, uh, actually there's, not, there's no employment creation. There are hour, in hours of work, uh, the many, there's de there has been deindustrialization already for a long time. So the most dynamic sector of the economy, and then on top of that, we had globalization, outsourcing, and offshoring, and so and so on. Uh, the, the, but the most dy dynamic sector in terms of productivity growth is not uh, creating jobs not to the extent needed. Now you can uh, in combination there's the there's the the, the fire sector, the finance and insurance and real estate, uh, which also for sometimes had high productivity growth, but I also think that we have to agree that most of that is either rent, rentier or rent based, or it is totally fictitious in the sense that it is a bubble and uh, it, it, it goes. I mean, there is a whole big issue here about what exactly the social efficiency of modern finance is. Anyway, that is a, that's a separate issue. But it's like FinTech, high tech uh, manufacturing in combination with finance, uh, ICT, uh, that, is a, that is the core, that's the dynamic part, but it's not generating jobs. So in a way, the main challenge confronting governments is that we, the, the, the area where there is growth is not the area where there are jobs. So wh what do we do with the surplus uh, population? I mean, Marx called this the, the reserve army. Uh, it's, anyway, there is, th th this is a problem. What happened, I mean, I'm from the Netherlands, and uh, we had a big unemployment problem in the end of the 70s. And the solution was, and this was very much with the support of the social Demo Democrats, and that is what are the, that's the dimension which I want to uh, put in into the discussion. Uh, the basic choice was, let us, I mean, we have this problem of unemployment, we want to revive growth, but more importantly, uh, we want to create employment. And uh, in a way, the social Democrats uh, went for an agreement in which they say we are going to 
introduce flexible labor markets for, for firms and moderate wages. And we do all these, these things like breaking down uh, social protection and so on, uh, because we give priority to jobs over, I mean, it, it's, it's more important for people to have a job than uh, to have uh, higher pay or whatever. In that process, uh, I mean, the, the work which has been created is low, product, low productivity jobs, it's low wage, it's very often what the ILO would call, I mean, they're not using the term, but it would be indecent, uh, non-decent uh, uh, jobs. Yeah, it's like, this is the kind of work which you actually sh wouldn't, you, you, as a society, you shouldn't want, uh, want it to the extent uh, that, uh, or uh, if, if, to the extent that that is not true, it, it is basically, it, it is, it, these are jobs which are very, very important. And uh, I mean, this is like education and it is in health and it is in many other things which are so social and public services, but then these jobs are basically underpaid. Yeah, it's like we, we have very important uh, services jobs, but we, we basically underpay them. Why do we underpay them? Because there is this notion of austerity, that is we can't afford to, anyway, there is this whole, and then at the same time, we can afford huge financial rents, huge uh, increases in the, in the incomes of the, of the top 1%. Uh, that is all affordable, but what is not affordable is to have uh, sort of uh, ta tax uh, systems which generate enough revenue to uh, create these decent societies. Yeah? So th this is all part of the same uh, thing. The second point, maybe I'm sort of drifting, but the second point is I think that in Europe, and it happened in Germany with the Hartz reforms and so on as well, the social democrats, which used to be the protectors of, uh, let's say, the decommodification and the welfare state and so on, uh, actually the social democrats, and I think in the US it would be the uh, democrats, actually bought into this narrative of, uh, well, we, ha we have to accept the market Hayekian neoliberal market economy in which we have markets as the intermediating or mediating uh, medium. Uh, we don't do anything, no state, no, nothing, no regulation, flexi flexibility, but uh, anyway. And, and they bought, and so what we want is we want employment. Employment is the social goal. And the result is huge increases in inequality, uh, very uh, uh, jobs which are underpaid or which are sort of not fulfilling. And uh, I think uh, very important also mentioned by Professor Standing is the fact that there is a lot of insecurity. Even people having uh, low paid, low weight uh, jobs uh, always face this uh, the insecurity of losing it. Yeah, I mean, it's like you are you're, you're not, and then how to build a life uh, on, uh, in such a situ uh, situation. Now that brings me to my last point, uh, which is, uh, it has to do, it's sort of related to this notion of social democratic parties. The Dutch so social democratic party actually totally imploded in the last election. The German social democratic party didn't do too well, uh, did not do well in the German election. Uh, uh, I think they basically lost this, they lost the plot somewhere. And, but my question to the, uh, panel, uh, to the panelists is, uh, two, two questions is uh, what happened here? And the other thing is, why is the uh, electorate, uh, why, why are so many voters uh, still voting, uh, let, let's say, for parties which are not sort of acting in their own, either they abstain or they are not acting in their own, in their interest? Yeah, why is it that, uh, in, in the US case, Trump, I mean, uh, from, seen from this side of the Atlantic, it would seem strange to believe that he would do anything in, uh, to help the, uh, let's say the middle classes or the, the, or the lower income classes. So wh why do people buy into this particular uh, narrative and, and, su and support uh, even worse? I mean, it's, it's not that it was not yet there, but sort of an intensified uh, uh, Hayekian uh, order. Yeah, that I'm, I'm, I see zero seconds, so I will, I will stop here. Thank you. I think maybe, does anyone on the panel want to respond to anybody's comments? I mean, nobody was attacked, so it's not exactly like one needs to defend oneself, but you might have a comment on somebody's. Uh, Marcella first, and then Guy. Thank you so much. So yeah, thanks to the discussions. I mean, they have introduced quite a lot of evidence and comments, very useful for, so for uh, for the future of, of my research. Uh, let me just comment one um, very briefly about some data shown by 
Um, oh gosh. <laughs> I put it. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I mentioned before the she session and the new then uh, need of monitoring uh, the impact uh, of the crisis on, on women's headed households. Uh, she has shown for the United States that most of the budget cuts were really concentrated in health sector, education, uh, and so on. Uh, which are, of course, as I mentioned before, I mean, sectors of the economy, mostly uh, women, uh, where mostly women are actually employed. So that's what I really had in mind before in speaking about the future of <laughs> of, the, of the future impact of the crisis. So thank you so much for showing us those figures. And a few other comments about flexibility. Mm? It is a very tricky word. Of course, in a gender perspective, flexibility has always had a very positive meaning. You know, having flexible time means that women can arrange their work in such a way to be able to reconciliate their working life with their private life, so family, children, and so on. But of course, that's where the trick comes. And of course, the Netherlands knows very well what I, what I speak about. I mean, low pay, so very high gender pay gap, uh, less and less uh, uh, security, as we said, a precariat that, of course, is becoming uh, not only for women, of course, for all the new generations, but I mean, women are always the main player in this sort of distress. And that's why, actually, and now I speak about my country, and, and I try to answer to your very important question. I mean, why so many women are actually voting? I don't want to say for Trump, but certainly they voted in the past for Berlusconi. Or they vote nowadays for the new populist movements, like uh, the Five Star Movements, because they think that they can have a better chance with these kind of people. And uh, there is a concept that I really, uh, that really comes very often into the, into the debate in Italy, which is, which is the concept of decency. You know, women look for decency, which is somehow, you know, considered a synonymous of dignity. I, certainly, we know that is not the case. But I mean, they look for decency and they think that this kind of people can really give a different opportunity to, to themselves. And don't forget that women in most countries are the majority of the voters. So this is extremely important to keep in mind. That's all for the moment. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me try to respond to your uh, good comments. Um, I think what we're seeing is the beginnings of the re-embedded phase of this global transformation. Every single day for the last six years, without exception, I get emails from people around the world saying they are members of the precariat, and they say the book was written for them. And I was invited to speak at Occupy Movements, Indignado, you know, various other places in 2011, 2012. And I think at that stage, a lot of people who were in the precariat felt they were failures. They felt this sense of, that I've been talking about, that they are failures, they have inadequacies, and so on. And I think what's been happening in the last few years is the first phase of a fight back, if you like. Because more and more of that third group are now passing the mirror test. They can look in the mirror in the morning and say, I'm part of the precariat. There are millions like me. I've got to do something about it. I've just come from Spain speaking to the Podemos uh, party, the leadership. And I think, you know, you've seen this in, your, in the Netherlands with the green left emerging which is far more a precariat oriented. The Corbyn leadership in this country has been far more, I've been, I, don't know, I didn't expect this, to be asked to be an economic advisor uh, to the, Liber, the Labour, Labour leadership. We're seeing um, Alternativet in Denmark. We're seeing Bernie Sanders in, in the United States, all beginning to articulate a precariat uh, thing. So I, I actually, beginning to feel optimistic because I think this atavistic part of the precariat 
has reached its peak. Let's be optimistic for a second. It's reached its peak in size. It's having terrifying effects, but the other two groups are emerging and they're beginning to re-engage in politics. So I, I do feel that, that we, we have hope. What has been terrible is how the left, the old left, the social democratic left, including the Democrat mainstream, have gone for a utilitarianism which has been dualistic in its characteristics. And ironically, I have a long section critiquing nudge in my, in my book, saying that Thaler is on the wrong track, it's going in the panopticon state direction. They even use a lot of expressions that come from Jeremy Bentham's book on the panopticon. And I think this is genuinely frightening if they're going to go in that direction. But I think the new precariat parties and movements are not going in that direction. They're looking for a revival of the enlightenment values. And that's going to be exciting for economists. Thank you. Um, one comment on all of that, of these points, which is that we actually have panels. We have one tomorrow morning on what were people actually thinking in some of these elections. And then there is a panel um, on uh, Monday uh, about political money, which if you are trying to find the roots of either Trump or the Social Democrats or the American Democrats' positions on this, you are going to have to look at. Now, I think we, we've got, do you want any more comments? Yeah, well, so I was going to comment as well on this, why are people voting against their interests? One of the slides I, I had to skip just in lieu of time was a slide that showed um, a Brookings paper that came out just after the election talking about how Clinton won high output America and Trump won low output America. And they, high versus low output were really proxies for urban versus rural. And of course, they were basing output purely on GDP. Now, one of the great frustrations of rural people is that they disproportionately provide things that urban people rely on. For instance, raw food product, energy, recreation amenities, retirement destinations. Oh, and by the way, they house a disproportionate percentage of prisoners and take on a disproportionate share of garbage, of trash. So can you imagine what would happen if a big mountain of trash just piled up in the middle of Times Square in New York? Well, that doesn't happen because it all gets shipped to my hometown in upstate New York. Okay, so rural people, when they see that stuff in the media about high output versus low output, what that leads to is them saying, see, I knew these urban elites didn't like us. They think they're better than us. And they dig in their heels and they double down because they have moral superior grounds at that point. So that's one. The other is that when we look at the difference makers for this election, I, I, we lose sight of this a lot and it's frustrating because Hillary Clinton received almost three million more votes than Donald Trump. In fact, Trump underperformed Mitt Romney nationwide. He got a lower proportion of the votes than even Mitt Romney got in 2012, and yet he won. And he won because of three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. 77,000 votes total across those three states are the difference maker, and probably why we're having this conference on this topic uh, right now, or at least a good, uh, good portion of that. And then you dig into those states even more and you realize it's just a handful of counties. It's a handful of counties in three states that were Obama counties twice in a row and they flipped for Trump. And when you look at those places, the economy has really tanked. Social relationships and cohesion has tanked. Family relationships have disintegrated. There are drug needles on corners. So when people walk out their front door, what they see is an, an America that doesn't look so great and hasn't looked so great for a long time. Just what? Yes, we will. Just one quick comment, which is, now, nah, there's no reason we would have to have this conference just for Trump. After all, there's Le Pen, Brexit, <laughs> Kurtz now in uh, Austria, the Freiheit Partei there, our Alternativa for Deutschland. And then and there's, yes, thank you, the builders. Uh, and we've got lots of reasons to have this conference. It's not, it's not, as some people seem to sometimes think when they heard about it, a Made in America conference about America. It's not. Uh, now, I think we have time for some questions. 
probably what's sensible is to take a couple quick ones and then ask people to respond. So we, we're looking for questions rather than speeches. Um, all right, suppose back there the, yes, that's just, yes. Can you repeat the, when we do that, we'll repeat the question. Yeah, so, I'm yeah, not. okay. And another question from, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I just wanted to uh, comment on inclusive growth. This morning, an important question was to refer to inclusive growth in relation to the analysis that this uh, inclusiveness and competitiveness are two sides of the same coin. There's no coin flip between these ideas. What are the panel think about this? Okay. All right, since we've got a bunch of people on the panel, and we've got three minutes left. We'll try these two questions first. So who wants to go first? Yeah. Okay, let me, let me say, it gives me a chance to advertise the new book, which is that I think the new income distribution system has got to find ways of capturing the various forms of rent, rental income, which have been multiplying. We need to levy, we need to attack intellectual property rights and things like that. But I, th I do believe that we've got to move to a basic income. I've been arguing for basic income for 30 years, and our, our network has thousands and thousands of members in about 50 countries now. And I think we've, we've reached a point where we have an almost perfect storm of factors that are contributing to the legitimation of a basic income, including the fact that a whole lot of Silicon Valley chief executives have been tripping over themselves to, to support it, which is not a, an unmixed blessing, I can tell you, for those of us who've been pushing from the left for a, a basic income. But I do think that it reflects the need to, to build basic security from the precariat's point of view. If ever I'm giving a talk to a precariat uh, group, they will always see the, the logic of having a basic income. I think it's affordable. I, I've summarized all the evidence. It doesn't reduce work. It improves mental health. We've gone pilots now in various countries, and the results have been remarkably positive. As you probably know, the, the Gee, pilots... Let's, let's the pilots, try I'll to stop end here. It here. Pilots in California, Canada, Scotland is about to launch some. I think that's an answer to your second question, because... Uh, 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 the First Minister has put funds aside to make, make that possible. So I think we're seeing a, a big advance in that. All right. Who else would like to comment? Service. Yeah, I think the, uh, the question about uh, in inclusive growth and competit competitiveness is a very important one. And the Scottish Prime Minister gave a very, very good talk uh, in the morning. Uh, but I do think that uh, it is sort of, this is what I tried to explain in the previous panel as well, that uh, it is, uh, I mean, in a way it's taken for granted. The, the, the standard approach is coming from, let's say, the OECD and the IMF and also the European Commission is still that uh, first we deregulate further, whatever you call it, uh, re-regulate, but you do it in favor of uh, employers. Uh, deregulate the labor, make labor cheap and flexible and uh, reduce uh, unit labor costs basically and then we have competitive, com uh, increased competitiveness and then we have growth and that growth will then trickle down and that is the inclusive part of it and I think that is actually not true and uh, uh, I personally think that the, the trade-off or the, conf the conflict between let's say inclus inclusiveness or equity and efficiency that is growth that trade-off is, is much, much uh, less uh, of a trade-off than what economists uh, generally believe. Yeah, yeah. Marcella, you get the last word because we have 13 Thank seconds. Thank you. No, just about Mrs. Sturgeon. And let me just say from an Italian point of view that this morning I dreamt for a moment <laughs> to have a prime minister like her. She mentioned gender equality seven times in her speech. Either she has a fantastic ghostwriter or she's a great person. And in any case, just remember, <laughs> or maybe both. <laughs> okay. We're anyway, out of just remember that out of this election that we just mentioned, most of the most reactionary forces in, in Europe are actually headed by women. And this is something that we should take into account. All right.
Thank you very much.